Hi everyone, this is me again, Nick Hopwood. Uh, this is a video uh, about a framework for analysis that I published about with Prachi Srivastava. It was initially her idea for her PhD and then I took it up and we published it together. Uh, it's actually my most cited article, maybe that's to do with it being open access, but this framework has been used or cited in 98 different publications by uh, towards the end of May 2014. So. Um, I think other people are finding it useful and what um, I'm going to do briefly in this video is explain some of the key ideas in it for you to maybe whet your appetite to go and have a look at the actual paper. Um, I'll come back to the camera in a minute but I firstly want to show you how you can find the paper. It is freely available. You can see here if you just put Srivastava Hopwood Framework Analysis into Google it'll come up and you can see a practical iterative framework for qualitative data analysis. If you click on that link, and it's in the International Journal for Qualitative Methods. If you click on that link, you'll then get to a page like this. You can see the padlock is unlocked. You can download the full text, no problem. And what you'll find is a PDF that looks like this. So you can see Prachi Srivastava was the first author, and Lena Copwood, I was the second author. Now, the article frames our approach within a broader discourse or... Um, discussion about the nature of uh, qualitative analysis and here is this table which I'm going to highlight there is basically the heart of the framework and I'll just zoom in a bit so you can maybe see it more clearly what are the data telling me that's the first question the second question what is it I want to know and the third question what is the dialectical relationship between these two questions. And you can see in brackets here there's something that expands on each of these. The question what are the data telling me is about theoretical and subjective and ontological and epistemological and what Prachi and I called field understandings. So what are the data telling me? The point here, I'll just come back so I can talk to you more directly, this is what are the data telling me? We're not assuming that data necessarily say the same thing to all people. So what are they telling me? We have theoretical understanding. So the data may speak to us in a particular way because of the theories that we have at our disposal. They're part of our sensitive sensibility as a researcher. That mean when we see something in the data, we see something different theoretically. And I've said in other videos, if I see an interaction between a teacher and a learner, I might see scaffolding. So the data might be telling me Scaffolding is happening there as a process of learning. There are also, we put the word subjective in there, meaning it doesn't mean that things are subjected to personal whims or preferences, but that any reading of the data is an interaction between the data and the person reading it. So what are the data telling me is a property of that interaction. Then there are field understandings, what the sort of the general sense we've got from our fieldwork about what's going on. We take things out of each interview, observation, focus group we do. So that's the first question. What are the data telling me? And in a sense, that's more like what you might call a grounded approach in which we open ourselves up to the data. In qualitative research, one of the strengths we have at our disposal, I think, is that we can be flexible and responsive. And it may be that the data are saying things you didn't expect that people are telling you things are important to them that you didn't realise would be important. Maybe you're going to want to change your research questions or build some of those things into your research in a different way. So we, first of all, can open ourselves up to what the data is saying. We make sure that we don't just get a funnel on and go exactly for what we were looking for. We first ask, what are the data telling me? But of course we acknowledge that they may say something else to different people. If I go back now to the PDF, the next question is there. What do I want to know according to research objectives, questions and theoretical points of interest? So what do I want to know? Okay, Or we if you're in a team-based research. So it could be what are the data telling us. And now it's what do I want to know? So this is about our questions and our aims. So in any data that we get, we already, normally often, had a particular purpose for getting that data. We might want to find a particular thing out. We may have a number of research questions or aims. Even in collaborative or participatory action research, there'll be something that we are wanting to look at when we look at data or look for. So this is, it could be a theory that's telling us to look for certain things. It could be a question which we want to find the answer to. 
or something else that's giving us that focus. And of course we want to ask, what do I want to know or what do we want to know? Now it's interesting to think about that and make it explicit because it may be that the data aren't brilliant for telling you what you want to know, in which case you might be able to refine your technique if you're interviewing differently or observing. It may make you realise that you're getting some of what you want to know but there are some gaps. So you might go and observe differently in future or try and observe something else or interview people in a different way. So there's what do I want to know or we want to know. What are the, sorry, first of all is what are the data telling me? Then what do I want to know? And then I'll bring the PDF back up again. It's what is the dialectical relationship between what the data are telling me and what I want to know? And Prachi and I use the word dialectical here. Really, it could have been iterative as well. It's, uh, but dialectical means that answer to one question kind of shapes the other one and immediately back shapes the original answer again. So we refine our focus and we link back to our research questions. So we think about as we expose ourselves or ask what the data are telling us and we then ask what is it I want to know, then the answer to those questions can keep changing the way we're looking at things. So as the data speak to us, or as we look for what the data have to say to us, that may change what we want to know. And as well, we look at for what we want to know, that will obviously filter and guide what we kind of allow the data to say to us. And that relationship will often be changing. And in the paper, we work through two different examples of how that works. I'm not, we're not necessarily saying that one question comes first or the others. Um, and in fact, if you read the paper, you can see we work through how it worked in Pratchett's study and then in my study. I just scroll down to show you a bit of how it worked in my study. So you can see here, at first, it, I did a study that involved three schools. So I did the three sequential case studies. At first, when I was analysing the data from the first case study, it was really a question of what are the data telling me. I wanted to be really open-minded, quite grounded in my approach, and to leave space to change my data collection or uh, generation techniques for the subsequent schools. Obviously there was a, a, a strong sense of what do I want to know in terms of keeping check that my data was in line with uh, my research questions or what Chanel will call Keeping Plum. He's written a great paper called uh, Keeping Things Plum in Qualitative Research. If you Google that you'll find it quite easily. It's free to access. Then over time in the second case study here in what I call Belmont School, it was kind of a growing thing about what I want to know. I had a stronger sense of what it was that I was looking for in my understanding about how pupils experience school geography. But I was still probably more largely determined by what the data were telling me. And then I was anal initially analysing the third case. This was really more uh, strongly influenced by what I want to know. And in fact, I was using what I wanted to know as a check to say, do I need to actually go on and continue with this case? Would I need a fourth case study, for example? As I then analysed all the three cases, what I wanted to know became even stronger. I had a clearer analytical focus. I started developing a typology of some ways in which pupils were thinking about geography. And in the final analysis, this was strongest still. So you can see in that example there, what the data were telling me and what I wanted to know kind of evolved gradually in a relatively linear fashion as I went from one case to the next and that was built in in my sequential case study design. That might not be the case in your study. It may be that they're much more fluid and um, you, you to and fro between those questions much more. Of course there were kind of more micro level variations. It wasn't that all my final analysis was what I want to know. There were lots of different um, movements between them but that was the broader sequence of things in my original PhD study. So I hope this, uh, this I think again, you've always, I mentioned this idea or in many of my videos or blogs, the idea of parsimony. I think one of the reasons why this has been cited so much is because rather like Hammersley's framework for critically appraising qualitative research, which I've done a video on and how I've adapted it and interpreted it a little bit differently, this is both simple and profound in its simplicity and therefore I think quite a powerful framework. Just three questions. What are the data telling me? What do I want to know? And what's the dialectical relationship between those two? Three questions. Easy to remember. Easy to communicate, I think. But each of those questions is complicated and has a lot to think about. I flagged the first one. has epistemological and ontological dimensions about what you think the nature of evidence is. 
about subjectivity, about theory. The second question about what I want to know opens up all the uh, readings and the ideas about what makes a good research question and how we might be purposive and whether we might over-determine an analysis through theories just by putting red goggles on and seeing the world as red, all that kind of thing. And then that question about how the answer to those two questions changes and how they influence each other, that's taking us to quite a sort of a deep technical level about the iterative nature of qualitative data analysis. So this is simple as a framework, but it's not dumbed down in terms of its content. So I think it's a simple framework that lets you do some really powerful thinking. I'd be really interested if you're um, trying, trying this out or going to find it useful. Please, as always, I encourage you to comment uh, critically but politely, if you wish, um, on the discussion boards below. If you're going to be joining me in the qualitative data analysis course, this will be one of the core things that we keep get referring to and will be part of the vocabulary or the language for the three days. What are the data telling me? What do I want to know? And what's the dialectical, dialectical relationship between those two things? I hope you found this video useful. As always, take care. Bye-bye.